Our scripture reading comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him who can eat or who can have enjoyment. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he, give, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. You know, there are very few things, church, in life that matter more uh, day in and day out than our perspective. You know, perspective has been defined as a sort of particular attitude or way of regarding something, a, a point of view, a way of seeing that leads to a way of being in the world. And uh, I was recently meeting with a dear neighbor of mine, a man who uh, over the last few months I began meeting with almost weekly to, to pray and to share the gospel with. And, uh, and the week before this particular day, we had met and talked through uh, various aspects of the good news of, of what it means if Jesus is truly the world's Lord. That's what we were sort of contemplating together, whether this man believed that he was. And, uh, and my neighbor said, you know, or he had really for the first time in his life, he seemed to understand what it meant to base his life to base his entire way of seeing and, and being in the world upon this reality that Jesus is truly the world's Lord. He, he understood that this confession, this belief, uh, this trust included sort of adopting a whole new way of life, a whole new perspective of living his life day by day. And after talking about this for a couple of hours together, uh, you know, we prayed and he asked God to help him do that, to build his life upon the Lord Jesus. And so this following week, we were meeting on his front porch to continue to discuss what it meant to actually follow Jesus in the day to day and through the hardships and temptations that sort of persuade us not to do so. And uh, in the course of that conversation, my neighbor, kind of reflecting on his current circumstances and his burdens, he said to me, he said, my life is less stable than it's ever been. And I knew what he meant in saying that. He meant that because of the coronavirus, he was out of work. He meant that he had no sense of what he was going to do about that, financially and vocationally, and, and that relationally speaking, he was feeling lonely and unsure of things, and that all of these circumstances, quite understandably, had left him feeling that particular morning less stable, less secure, less happy, less flourishing, that he had felt in some time. And so I, I just let him, I let him talk for a minute and share those burdens. And then I tried to sort of gently validate what he was feeling and then offered in light of the conversation that we had had the previous week about the gospel. I offered him and said, you know, there's also another perspective for you to consider here as well. The perspective that because you have come to believe that Jesus is Lord, your life's actually more secure and more stable than it's ever been, despite what you're feeling. And then we opened up to the Sermon on the Mount and we read Jesus saying this, blessed or happy, flourishing, even my friends are stable, secure, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And we read through this, and I asked my friend, my neighbor, I said, it doesn't seem like those who are poor, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst, those who are persecuted or blessed, does it? It seems like actually those who are rich and those who laugh 
and those who are filled, those who are surrounded by acclaim and comfort, they're the ones that are blessed. They're the ones that are stable. They're the ones that are secure. They're the ones that are flourishing, doesn't it? And even as once, you know, one French pastor once said, you know, most people, uh, they hold to this erroneous belief that the one who's blessed, the one who's happy, is the one who's free from annoyance, the one who attains all his wishes, and the one who leads a joyful and easy life. And yet, I told my neighbor, what Jesus says here exposes this as a false perspective. And even as the French pastor went on to say, you know, the disciples of Jesus must learn the philosophy of placing their happiness beyond the world and above the afflictions of the flesh. And so what I reminded my neighbor that morning in light of what Jesus taught here is that this is exactly what Jesus is inviting him to do in this season of his life that feels so unstable, so insecure. That Jesus is inviting him to build and place his happiness both now and forever beyond the reaches of the world, beyond the sun, upon the rock of Jesus himself. And I encourage my neighbor, I said, because you're doing that, Despite what it looks like or feels like from the perspective of the world, you are actually more stable, more secure, more safe than you've ever been in your entire life. And my neighbor was sort of almost speechless at this difference in perspective. And this is the very perspective, the wise way of seeing and being in the world that Koheleth is offering us here in his conclusion to this first section of Ecclesiastes in verses 24 to 26 of chapter 2. We get to the end of this epic journey here that Koheleth has led us through, and we see that he's not trying to depress us, as many think that he is. He's actually trying to help us as God's people to live wisely. And so this first section of Ecclesiastes, like most of wisdom literature, including Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it ends with this contrast between the wise and the fool. The wise person is the one who acknowledges and fears God, is the one who is able to find joy and see good in this world despite all of the futility that the world's been subjected to. And they're able to do this because they're not trusting that their hope for stability and security and fulfillment will be found in anything or anyone under the sun. That's the wise person. And on the flip side, the foolish person is the one who, despite all of the evidence and all of the testimony to the contrary that Koheleth has clearly laid out in this first section of Ecclesiastes, the foolish person is the one who continues to anchor their hope under the sun. And to believe that if I just had more of this, or if I just had less of that, if I or my family could just get to this point, then I would be more stable. Then I would be more secure. Then I would be more satisfied. And so we get to the end of this first section of Ecclesiastes, and Kohelet's conclusion leaves us with a clear choice. In a world that has been subjected to futility, are we going to join the wise and build our lives upon a hope, upon a perspective, upon a sure foundation that is beyond the sun? Or are we going to join the foolish and build our life upon a perspective that can only see under the sun? An insecure and fleeting foundation. And obviously, Koheleth is urging us to join the wise. And so, as we talked about last week, the outworking of a wise life that Koheleth recommends here seems almost too simple. To eat and drink and find enjoyment in our toil in this world that's filled with futility. But simple as it may seem, let's look at it here. Really, let's think about it in three sections. Let's look at the good of enjoyment in verse 24. Then let's think about the God of enjoyment in verse 25. And then let's think about the wisdom of enjoyment in verse 26. So the good of enjoyment, the God of enjoyment, and the wisdom of enjoyment. And we'll spend the most time on the first one here, the good of enjoyment. Look at verse 24 here, which is where we ended our reading last week. Kohelet says, in light of all of the futility, in light of all of the vexation, 
all of the grief, all of the fatigue, all of the injustice, all of the uncertainty, all that we cannot control as we live and toil in this crooked world. He says, I have concluded, verse 24, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. And every time I read that sentence, the force of it, this simple, profound statement, it almost seems to grow in my mind and my heart. There's nothing better for a person in light of everything that he's seen and everything that he's experienced and everything that he's said. There's nothing better for a person than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in the toil. And, you know, the phrase there at the end of that verse, find enjoyment, it literally means to see the good. There's nothing better, Cohella says, than to see and to be in the world with this kind of perspective, with this kind of attitude, an attitude that in light of all of the crookedness and all of the futility and all of the vexation and all of the injustice and all of the grief, an attitude that is intent on seeing and enjoying what is still good in this world. Those symbols, that is a powerful, and for me, even as I confessed in last week's teaching, a difficult word of wisdom to receive and live into. And, uh, and maybe you can relate, but again, on the surface, what he says, it almost feels to me overly simplistic, if not escapist. In fact, it almost seems similar to the attitude uh, in a godless and hopeless culture that Paul decried in 1 Corinthians 15, the attitude that says, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You know, the Apostle Paul's whole point there in 1 Corinthians 15 in referencing that cultural colloquialism is that if the Lord Jesus has not been raised from the dead and therefore we ourselves have no hope of resurrection, have no hope beyond the Son, then we should adopt this attitude. We should adopt an attitude of, of hedonism, of, of giving ourselves without limitation to pursuing whatever pleasure our hearts desire. Because this life, and particularly the, the pleasures of common grace that we experience in it under the sun, is really all there is. And on the surface, it sounds almost like Koheleth is saying the same thing, doesn't it? Is he? Is he, is he telling us to adopt the perspective of life that the Apostle Paul explicitly or at least implicitly condemns and says belongs to those who have no hope beyond the sun? No. He's not. And though it may seem like it on the surface, may not, may not seem like it on the surface, these two statements, the one that Koheleth makes in verse 24 and the one that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 15, are reflective of two totally different perspectives about life. The attitude the Apostle Paul is highlighting and again, implicitly condemning, is an attitude rooted in the rejection of God. And therefore, the rejection of any hope beyond the sun. It's a selfish attitude that says and sees the whole point of life as selfishly seeking as much pleasure as we can. Because again, ultimately, there's nothing beyond this world. No life after death, no resurrection, nothing beyond the sun. So get what you can now. And in this perspective and attitude about life, life is reduced to seeking as much pleasure as possible under the sun. The perspective that Kohel is encouraging us to adopt couldn't be more different than this. He's saying that we should seek to see the good and to find enjoyment in our toil precisely because there is nothing. There is no amount of food or drink or sex or power or justice or comfort or wisdom or wealth under the sun that is ever going to be able to satisfy our deep longings. There is no amount of earthly pleasure that can provide us the security and stability and fulfillment that we crave and seek. And Koheleth is saying, because of this, because of the futility of all things under the sun, one of the wisest things we can do is to learn to see and enjoy the good that comes to us in this wilderness. Yeah. To eat and drink and find enjoyment, not from the perspective of this life being all that there is, not as a slave to our lusts because of that perspective, but from the perspective of those who have been liberated from the illusion that any pleasure under the sun will ultimately satisfy. That's right. 
from the perspective of those who know that what we're looking for is ultimately beyond the sun. And so in other words, once we realize that what we're hungering and thirsting for deep down cannot be satisfied by anything under the sun, we are actually freed up. We're freed up to see and to eat and to drink and enjoy common pleasures under the sun for what they are. Gifts. Manna. Daily bread that God gives us to help us endure through this wilderness. There is nothing better, Kohel tells us, than to eat and drink and find enjoyment. To see the good. And to do so in the midst of our toil. Right in the midst of all of the crookedness and the futility and the vexation and the restlessness and the injustices and the griefs and the sorrows of this world. You know, it's actually, as I was thinking about this yesterday, the image that David painted in Psalm 23, the part of it we don't usually focus on, that image came to mind where David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my hands. What Kohelet is offering is almost this imagery of God giving us food right in the midst of our enemies, right in the midst of the toil and the brokenness and the rubble and the futility of the world. And this is Kohelet's vision of what living into wisdom in a crooked world looks like, to feast, to find enjoyment in the midst of the rubble. And so I wonder, are you able, am I able without in any way reducing the pain of the world or ignoring it, to still see the good? And maybe even more fundamentally, we can ask, do you more easily see the futility and the crookedness of this world or the good? And certainly there's a lot underneath how we answer that question and why we answer the way that we do. And, and again, I think it cuts much deeper than just, are you a kind of glass is half full or a glass is half empty type of person? Are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? It's deeper than that. And, and there's a ditch on either side, you know, for those who are more inclined and easily able to find enjoyment in this world and see the good. There's a ditch toward, I think, for those that are more easily inclined in that direction, in that perspective. There's a ditch toward forgetting that we're living, is, as the Lord Jesus once put it, days of fasting. And not days of eternal feasting. And so that means that our lives as followers are meant to be marked by such aching and longing and praying for Him to return and make all things new, such that we often set aside eat, you know, food and drink so that we can yearn for Him to make what's crooked straight. And so the ditch for those, I think, maybe that are more inclined for an assortment of reasons, based on your testimony, your temperament, just an assortment of reasons, those that are inclined to to more easily see the good of this world, the ditch is to not forget this, to not forget that these are days of feasting, of fasting rather, not days of feasting. And that's a temptation to forget, because after all, who likes being sad? Who likes fasting? Now, there's also a ditch on the other side for those like me, those who are, I think, more inclined to see the futility and brokenness of the world day in and day out. We're more prone to sort of notice and feel and carry burdens about all the hard, unjust, sad things of this world. And on this side, there's a ditch of hopelessness and cynicism that keeps us from finding enjoyment and seeing the good that exists despite the brokenness of this world. There's a temptation for those like me to not feast in the midst of all the fasting, so to speak, when God provides us a meal. And according to Kohelet, it is not righteous or spiritual or wise to be so sad about the crookedness of this world that we don't see or enjoy the good gifts and the daily bread that the good God of it gives us. It's, it's, not, it's not righteous to be more spiritual than Jesus in that, in that manner. And uh, even as I said last week, this is one of the hardest lessons I've been learning over the, over the past few years. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm still not sure why, but I have a very, very hard time seeing the good because my senses are inclined to be overwhelmed with all the bad and sad. And, and it's, not, it's not just that I don't notice the good. I, I can notice the good, 
But I can see a hundred good things in one bad thing, and I'll typically walk away thinking about it, if not burdened by the one bad thing, and not the hundred good things. Now, I, I, again, I think some of that's due to the way that I'm, God's gifted and wounded and shaped, shaped me over my life, but, but whatever the case, what I'm confessing, and maybe you can relate, is that it's hard for me, it's hard work to practice feasting, to practice eating and drinking and finding enjoyment. In the same way that for some of you, it's hard work to practice fasting and lamenting. But what I want to highlight here, in light of the wisdom that Koheleth is offering us, is that it's not either or. And there's a ditch on either side. If we're to join the wise, if we want to live into wisdom, we must neither avoid seeing or experiencing the pain of this world, or let the pain that we see and experience in this world become our identity. To be wise requires us to both see that this world is crooked and subjected to futility and not able to give us, therefore, the stability and, and, and security and satisfaction we're longing for. It's to both see that and to eat and drink and find enjoyment in our toil. And part of Kohela's point, I think, is that in order for us to endure as God's people through this wilderness, through all of the crookedness and futility and vexation and restlessness and injustices and sorrows of this world, we have to learn to see the good. Not because there's no futility in this world, but because precisely because there's so much of it. So how do we do that? How do we eat and drink and find enjoyment in our toil, in the futility? And how do we do so not as licentious fools who deny God and have our hopes set on pleasure, but as wise people, as those who fear God and understand that the enjoyment we seek and find under the sun will not ultimately satisfy? Well, we can only eat and drink and find enjoyment in our toil in the way Koheleth is counseling us to when our hope is built upon the unshakable foundation that is beyond the sun. When our hope is resting in God himself, who is the rock of our salvation. Kohela says that only when our hope is built on and resting in the God of enjoyment can we truly find enjoyment in the gifts that come from his hand under the sun. So let's look at this here in verse 25. This is the good of enjoyment. Now let's look at the God of enjoyment. Verse, the end of verse 24, it says this. It says, this also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from Him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? And, you know, this is only the second time that Kohel has explicitly mentioned God in Ecclesiastes thus far. If you remember, the first time was all the way back in verse 13 when he said, it is an unha unhappy business, a terrible preoccupation that God has given to the children of mankind to be busy with. And, and so this is the second time he mentions God and the enjoyment that Koheleth is urging us toward in verse 24 and 25 here, as scholar Derek Kidner put it, is the other side of the unhappy business that God has given to the sons of men. That was talked about in verse 13. The other side of that unhappy business is for us to see and enjoy what is good. And see that it too comes from the hand of God. And as Kinder goes on to explain, what this helps us see is that in themselves and rightly used, the basic things of life are sweet and good. And what spoils them is our hunger to get out of them more than they can give. So in other words, the reason Kohela is counseling us to see and enjoy the good is precisely because every good experience, every beautiful relationship, every enjoyable taste or smell, every heartfelt laugh, everything good and perfect that we encounter is a gift from our good God's loving hand. That's right. What spoils them, what makes them futile and enslaves us, as Koheleth has been telling us, is not these basic things being bad or futile in and of themselves. What spoils them is our hunger to get more out of these good things 
than they can give. That's what makes them futile. Is when we look to them, when we look to food and drink and sex and work and money and relationships and comfort and achievement to provide us only what God gave. The God of enjoyment. And something that can get easily lost here, I think, if we don't hold and read this entire first section of Ecclesiastes together as one unit, is that Koheleth is telling us that the same God who gives to mankind the unhappy business that we're busy with is the God who gives enjoyment. In other words, both the pleasant and the unpleasant of this life in this world come to us through the loving hands of God. So as Job so memorably put it in the painful moment of worship that's recounted there at the end of Job 1, the Lord, the same Lord gives and takes away. Now, depending on what day or season of life we're in, it can feel easier to see that the Lord is giving or that the Lord and what the Lord is taking away. But both are true. And Kohela's point here is not to get into some sort of theological argument about the sovereignty, about the governance of God over all things, which he assumes is true, as I do. Kohela's point is that we should eat and drink and find enjoyment in our toil because just like our subjection to such toil, the enjoyment that comes in the midst of it, for those who have eyes to see, comes from God. Beloved, what Koheleth is telling us is that the God of enjoyment in his mercy provides us enjoyment. He provides us feasts even in the midst of all the futility. And though we may not control when or how or in what form these moments, these, these feasts of enjoyment come to us, the wise will cultivate eyes to see them. And when they spot them, they will eat and drink and find enjoyment in what the Lord of enjoyment gives, just as the wise will learn to trust God in what he takes away. And church, this is actually the message that's at the heart of Ecclesiastes, that it's only when God and all that he has promised us in Christ is the center of our hope that everything else in life can be put in its proper place can be seen in its proper perspective. Only when our hope is rooted beyond the sun in the God who is over both the futility and the enjoyment we experience can both the pain and the pleasures of this life under the sun be put in their proper place. Only when the God of enjoyment is the foundation of our hope will we be able, without turning either what the Lord has given or what he was taken into an idol, will we be able to find enjoyment in this crooked world? And in verse 26, Koelith ends this first section of Ecclesiastes by drawing a clear distinction between the wise who learn to live into this perspective and the foolish who do not learn to live into this perspective that is anchored in a vision of the God of joy over all things. So let's look here lastly at the wisdom of enjoyment. So the good of enjoyment, the God of enjoyment, now the wisdom of enjoyment. Verse 26, it says, For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, literally the one who misses the mark, of this wisdom that he's been offering us. He has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God, which is also vanity and a striving after the wind. So in other words, to the wise, Kohelet says, those who have acknowledged the futility of life under the sun and who have set their hope on the God who reigns beyond the sun, to the wise comes the wisdom from God to find joy in the midst of this crooked world. But the fool, Kohelet says, those who refuse to look beyond the sun for stability and security and salvation, those who miss the mark in their perspective 
And in the way that they're seeking to be in the world in light of they, that, their perspective, they remain stuck in futility. They continue to chase the wind, destined to the business of what he says here, gathering and collecting only ultimately to give to the one who pleases God. The fool's doing all the gathering and all the collecting, all the futile things he's been talking about only at the end of the day for all that they've gathered and collected to be ultimately given the wise, to be given the one who pleases God. It sure doesn't feel like that, though, does it? It doesn't always feel like those who have put our hope in Jesus Christ in a way that's pleasing and acceptable to God. It doesn't feel like we've been given wisdom and knowledge and joy. And it doesn't feel like those who have not done it, those who have set no limits to seeking pleasure now, it doesn't feel like they're filled with the unhappy business of gathering and collecting only at the end of it all to give to us, does it? I think it's easy as we seek to pick up our cross each day and follow Jesus to lose this perspective or at the very least to doubt this perspective being true. And as we do, as, as we day by day look around and we see the pleasure and the success and the comfort and the notoriety that our culture has to offer, it becomes so easy for us as God's people to drift away from enjoying the gifts that come through God's hands to us each day because we start comparing the gifts to what others seem to be experiencing around us. We start comparing our own lives and our own day-by-day -day experiences of cross-bearing to the pleasure and experiences that so many others just are posting on Instagram each day. And before we know it, we are caught in this web of covetousness and discontentment and greed. We actually begin to envy the foolish and wicked in our hearts. We're actually tempted to wish that we were like those who we know are missing the mark in their perspective and in where they have put their hope. I mean, even right now, I assume that most of us, if not all of us, we have something that we're tempted to covet in this world. Some relationship, some vacation, some job, some platform, some privilege, some form of security, something that we look out in the world and we say, if only in our hearts, if I could just have that, then I would find more joy in my life. If I could just get there, then I'd see more good in my life. And if, if I, once I just get past this, then I'll be able to finally rest. And in all of it, in all of our coveting and lusting and discontent over the daily bread, that God gives us each day, not only have we forgotten the wisdom that Koheleth has proclaimed to us throughout this entire first section of Ecclesiastes, we have also lost the perspective that in boldness, he asserts right here in verse 26. A perspective from beyond the sun that declares to us that the wise, those who have forsaken putting their hope in anything under the sun, will ultimately, in a way that is unimaginable to us now, we will inherit all the pleasure that the fool has gathered and stored up for themselves under the sun. And on that day, Koheleth is telling us, echoing the teaching of the Lord Jesus himself, on the day when we receive all that's been gathered and collected by the fool, we will not be sorry that we placed our hope beyond the sun. We will not covet the fool anymore. We will not be sad that we trusted our hope Beyond the sun. And again, I think Gary Kinder, scholar, he's helpful in leading us to sort of feel the force of this reversal that Kohelet envisions here. He says this, Kinder does. He says, quote, The fact that in the end, the sinner's hoard will go to the righteous is only a crowning irony to what was in any case vanity and a striving after the wind. And for the righteous, it's a crowning vindication. But he says, but no more. 
Because like the meek who are promised the entire earth, our treasure is elsewhere anyway and of another kind. Ours is a treasure. Ours is a feast that we're looking to beyond the sun. So in conclusion, Koheleth is telling us that in a world subjected to futility, this is the wise way. This is the righteous way. This is the narrow way. This is the only way to find the stability and security and fulfillment, the salvation that we're all longing for deep down. The pleasures of life, as good as they are, and as much as they're to be received and enjoyed from the hand of God, they cannot offer lasting stability and security and fulfillment. And life's adversities, as unenjoyable and as painful and as tragic as they are, they need not lead us to utter ruin. Because there's a stability, there's a security, there's a type of enjoyment that can be found in and through our suffering, in and through our world, this, our journey through this world that is subjected to futility. And as we learn as God's people to fear God, as we learn to seek our security and our stability in Him, we grow in the wisdom and the skill of living into this perspective and into a world that we often can't make sense of. A world where we often can't trace God's hand of goodness or providence in what is being given or in what is being taken away. Which leads us and to look at the suffering, to look at the injustices, to look at the vexation and grief and restlessness and security and futility we experience again. It tempts us to look at that from a different perspective than what Kohelet is offering us. But again, the kind of people rooted in heavenly perspective that Kohelet is inviting and teaching us to be are those who anchor our hope beyond the sun. And though not explicitly, the entire way through, Kohelet is pointing us to our Lord Jesus. The one who, though the Son of God, experienced and willingly took upon himself all of the frustrations, all of the vexation, all of the injustices, all of the griefs, all of the sins, all of the sorrows, all of the groanings, all of the futility of this world. And he endured them so that he could set us free. Jesus, the one who, as he hung on the cross for us, and then was raised from the dead, the one who actually has blazed for us this narrow way, this way of the blessed, though it may not feel like it now, that we are now called and empowered by his spirit to follow him down. And so Christian, Church, beloved, take heart. This is the life that we're living into together. And though it may feel less stable and less secure and less satisfying in the here and now, it is ultimately the only way to find the blessing of salvation that deep down we're all craving for. Let's ask God to help us continue to do that together which includes enjoying the good that comes from the God of enjoyment as his people. And so, Father, there's so much tension in this wisdom that Kohelet offers us. We feel it all the way through, and yet there's nothing better for us than to eat and drink and find enjoyment to see the good in the midst of this futility. Not as an escapist, way of living, but as a way to endure through the wilderness. And so even as we pray, as we often do, as the Lord taught us to do, give us this day our daily bread, Lord. We ask for neither poverty nor riches, but our daily bread. And help us as you give it each day to see it, and with grateful, glad hearts to feast on it that it might sustain us until that final day, Lord, when you return and we share together the eternal feast 
at the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's in Jesus' name we pray.